Hi, everybody. On behalf of Bolton Street Programs and Elsie Secure, I'd like to welcome you today. Uh, for those of you who don't already know me, my name is Kristen Frieda, and I'm the Cyber Program Manager at Bolton Street Cyber Solutions. I'm joined today uh, with our partner at Elsie Secure, uh, Gordon Mallon, who's the co-founder and chief operating officer, uh, and Josh McDonald, who's the chief underwriting officer, uh, who will be going over the, the topic today, cybersecurity challenges affecting small businesses. So I'm going to pass it off to Gordon and Josh, and they'll give a, a brief intro on themselves, and then they'll go into the uh, conversation. Excellent. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, so uh, Gordon Malin, co-founder and COO. Um, my background has been about 20 years in the in the insurance space, but always from the vantage point of uh, investing in insurance companies. So all the all the global PNC carriers are uh, all the companies that I've been focused on for the last two decades. And it was through through that lens that I watched the the evolution of the cyber product again, which pretty much started about two decades ago as a very simple risk transfer product, and kind of evolved, you know, with some services around you know BBR and the Beasley product, and is really now uh, in the last year taking a, a material kind of, I would say, move forward in terms of what the actual cyber product and what um, companies like Alpha Secure are actually bringing it to to the table beyond just the risk transfer element. Um, so watch the cyber product evolution, watch the insure tech evolution. Um, and you know, a few years ago uh, with my co-founder Prita, we set out to, to build a, a differentiated solution specifically for the small business in the lower end of middle to really kind of um, solve for all the insurance needs. Um, but we obviously needed underwriting capabilities. And so we brought on a, a Josh McDonald um, and I'll pass to Josh for a quick intro and then we'll go into a presentation. Thanks, Gordon. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, Josh McDonald, the CEO here at Alpha Secure. Uh, before I came to Alpha Secure, I was at Beasley, where I may have worked with some of you in some capacity. I was the cyber uh, underwriting manager for the New York office, where I managed a book of over 100 million in both uh, small, middle, and large accounts. And then before that, I was at Ace and Chubb, when after a spot Chubb, and I had, wore a lot of different hats there. I, I started my career in insurance uh, after I left private practice as an attorney in the cyber claims group at ACE. And then I moved over to the underwriting side uh, with Chubb uh, before moving over to Beasley. But uh, looking forward to discussing this with you today. And I've had a lot of, a lot of experience in the, in the soft market um, when cyber insurance just started to take off to now where it's become a main street risk and everybody uh, is trying to buy uh, and the challenges that SMEs are, are facing in this market. Thanks, Josh. So what we want to do today, we're going to go through a bit of a presentation, but we want to leave plenty of time at the end for, for questions. I'm definitely want to be able to interact with you guys, answer all your questions. Um, we're really going to go through the lens of what, what we'll talk a little bit about our, our product. Really, what we're trying to do here is just really educate, right? And kind of so our product and some of the things that we've built really speak to where we think the industry is headed and what small businesses need in today's environment. Um, so with that being said, I'm just going to kind of start at a kind of a high level view. Again, it's not it's not news to anyone on this call what's going on in cyber, right? There is um, a massive amount of um, uh, uh, threats from, you know, there's tension between foreign nation states. We have the, basically the proliferation of, of ransomware, which really kind of came off the back of, uh, you know, the work from home um, environment, uh, you know, during the pandemic and will continue post pandemic, right? I think we're all kind of, you know, seeing, witnessing what's going on where some people are going back to work, it's few and far between and, and full companies are, are changing changing their entire kind of work environments and, and the thought of actually having physical footprints. So all of that is to say that the, that the attack, the exposure of small businesses and <clears throat> of all businesses for that matter, um, is, is going parabolic. And even if you go back pre-COVID, pre realistically, the way to think about kind of the exposure, uh, the loss exposure from a, um, from a cyber perspective, just think about the digitalization of Main Street, right? As more and more businesses move all their operations online, that's really what's driving um, the exposure. Um, and the thing that most people kind of, we all talk about and see the headlines, ransomware, and we read about what's going on and we read about, um, you know, people with losses and all the all the issues that that kind of com, you know comprise kind of the cyber cyber risk landscape. But realistically, that's all driving the demand side of it. You know, you guys have insureds, businesses come in come into you looking for looking for um, uh, cyber coverage. But the, there's the whole other side of the coin, and that is what is going on from a supply perspective. And that's a really kind of interesting 
um, topic to understand a what happened because then you could understand where it's headed and so if you kind of take a, a step back for go go back even two years you know as josh was talking about the soft market you know the cyber soft market really kind of came to an end um you can almost pinpoint it to the to the to the week it was about a third week of january in 2021 and that's where you had three or four markets all at the same time basically reverse course and stop doing it the old way. And they basically all moved to raise rates, re-underwrite, um, uh, demand changes in terms of conditions, and obviously conveyed those messages back back to you guys. Um, and that was really off the back of a massive spike in ransomware, which really was just driving attritional losses, right? And if you think about the loss content <clears throat> prior to ransomware and the pro loss content that ransomware drove, um, ransomware drove loss content anywhere from like two to three X. So it was, and if you think about, you know, insurance carriers, what they saw, and it was quite honestly the first time ever, they saw a line of business, <clears throat> excuse me, go through an attritional loss, um, loss change, a step function of that materiality. There isn't, hasn't been another line of business that did that, and that scared the heck out of everyone. So they obviously responded with increased rates, terms and conditions, and a real kind of change in how they underwrote the business. Um, <clears throat> and that was what initially kind of put us into this kind of hard market. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the same time, you had this, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Let me jump in, Gordon. Oh. You got it. <clears throat> At the same time, you had this um, uh, understanding of, of systemic risk that came into play. Solar winds was December of 20, uh, Microsoft Exchange, January of 21. And what all these carriers realized is that forget the attritional loss change that it, that it uh, quickly turned with ransomware, what they all realized is they were all exposed to these single points of failure. So they began to look at their TIV and their total sums insured across their books and realized, oh my God, if solar winds, which kind of exposed 18,000 organizations, if that wasn't a, um, a, a vulnerability used for basically nation state espionage purposes, if that was a vulnerability used to um, exploit companies from a ransomware perspective, I mean, it was, it was lights out. And so all of a sudden there was this understanding that um, the cat risk, the aggregation risk in cyber um, was, was incredible. So not only did the industry have to solve for the attritional loss trend change with ransomware, but they had to solve for the notion that um, you basically had aggregation risk that made, made from, a, from a property perspective, it made it seem like everyone lived in Florida on a fault line and exposed to wildfire. And that is really what has set forward this hard market. And quite honestly, we'll probably continue to keep the supply of capacity limited um, and will keep us in this perpetual, I would hope it goes from hard to at least, you know, somewhat of a affirming or stable market in short order, but the industry's playing catch up right now to make sure that they get on the right side of the aggregation issue, because with the aggregation issue comes an increased capital charges. So all that translates when you kind of, when you're the actuary or the CRO, basically all that translates into multiples of price increases, right? And I don't need to tell you guys, anyone that's tried to price a cyber renewal in the last few months, um, you know, you're looking at material multiples in terms of what that what that price is what the, for that premium. And um, while we had a massive step function on that, that's only gonna continue to push higher. Hopefully we got to get to a place where it's, you know, 10, 15% rate increases versus 300% rate increases, but understanding that the supply of capacity is, not going to be able to keep up with demand, I think is the first is the first part of understanding what the cyber insurance market looks like as we kind of look out over the next over the next five years. There's two two things I, I just want to jump in on that, that prior slide real quick, because they are extremely important, especially when you are focusing on a small business, um, is the misconception of risk and then the budget restraints. Those are sort of the two biggest uh, issues that we are still having in selling to Main Street risks. So misconception of risk is, you know, I don't have a website. I don't, I don't have, I don't have a cyber risk. Why do I need a cyber policy? And believe it or not, you know, in 2022, we're still trying to get over that hurdle with a lot of small businesses and we'll discuss the coverages later and some of the, uh, the issues that an SMB is facing uh, and their misconception or risk. 
uh, to the point that, you know, if you have email, if you're conducting any type of wire payments, et cetera, those are all types of risks that are all contemplated underneath of um, cyber policies. And we'll, we'll dive into that, but it is, it is a hurdle that, that agents like yourselves are, are dealing with still to this day uh, and, and, have, and having small businesses understand that they actually do have a cyber risk that is covered under a policy and it is valuable. And then of course, the budget restraints, as Gordon had mentioned, all of the reasons for the hard market, what, what unfortunately that has resulted in is, is, is risk and, and insurance coverage for a small business that's almost un, unobtainable because now it's gotten so expensive or the, the burdens and the requirements to become insurable have become too expensive to purchase. Um, and so those are two uh, wins, headwinds going against the insured and the small business uh, right now in the cyber landscape. So I wanted to point those two out and we will be discussing more of those um, later on. Yeah, to, the, to that end, what we did is just kind of highlighted some of the statistics around, you know, the risks that, that your clients actually face, you know, it kind of goes to that, you know, as Josh alluded to that misconception of risk, um, the risk for all businesses um, is, is immense, you know, if you think about small businesses, um, you know, 43% of all cyber attacks target small businesses, I think that's a stat that is, um, that's scary, right, and it's a stat that I think if you kind of ask your Main Street business, you know, are they exposed, most of them would say no. No, not me. But the reality is um, they are. Every, everyone is. Um, if you think about um, the amount of, of, of kind of lost content in the system, you know, half of it is in the small business space. Um, we'll talk about this in a moment, but um, the reality is for small businesses is they don't have the resilience in place either that large organizations do, right? Large organizations have um, business continuity plans, et cetera, et cetera. So if they do have a risk um, or a, a cyber event, their ability to kind of sustain their business is much easier for that of a small business. Um, the stats are scary. 60% of small businesses that suffer cyber attack go out of business within six months. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, clearly, COVID um, and the COVID environment work from home uh, made it, it kind of uh, multiply the, ex the exposure and that enabled uh, basically low hanging fruit for the bad guys. You know, all they would do is look for open RDP port. So to talk about some kind of stats on the insurance side of, of the game, you know, two thirds of the loss content for small businesses. So two thirds of the loss ratio is driven by ransomware. Over two thirds of ransomware events were due to open RDP ports. Um, RDP ports, remote desktop protocols, that is essentially the, the port on your machine that is open to be able to uh, for, enable people who are working from home to remote into an office environment. Those um, RDP ports typically are protected only by uh, you know, username and password, which are typically pretty weak or bad actors can can buy those compromised credentials on the dark web. That is how two thirds of all ransomware events basically get started. So if you think about that from a small business perspective, right, large businesses know that, and they put MFA in front of them to be able to solve for that, basically solve for that, that amount of frequency. Small businesses don't even know what an RDP port is. Um, so the, the knowledge or the knowledge gap, that poverty gap that small businesses kind of suffer from is what's leading to a, a massive differentiation in, in the losses that are, that are being driven in small. So again, it's just a matter of education or, um, you know, from our perspective, being able to, to bundle those services, which take care of that on behalf of the small business with the risk transfer to be able to have a cohesive product. Um, and that we're, that's where we think that kind of the future of small business insurance is headed, is not just a risk transfer product, but being able to actually bundle, bundle everything together. And we'll talk about that momentarily. Um, going back to to see them, to, to small businesses and how they're exposed, you know, kind of the the way I, the way we kind of oversimplify it is, you know, just kind of when you're talking to your small business client and um, they think they're you know they're not exposed. The reality is, um, at any point, at any day, any morning, they can walk in, turn on their computers, and that you know. Um, proverbial skull and crossbones pops up and they have no access to their systems, to their data. Um, the reality is, you know, as the stats will, will show you, that can happen to almost anyone and happens to a vast majority of small businesses. Um, that, if that happens, you're basically done as a small business. Most, got, most small businesses do not have a resilient backup. If they have backups, they're, they're not segmented um, and they're on the same network. So they're compromised the same way all their, you know, their master files are. Um, so any, any application, any software that a business uses, those are all sources of compromise. So 
any any business that uses essentially has any cloud service and application that runs in the cloud um, that they're all exposed as much as any other business so it's really a matter of just kind of simple education to them to understand that basically if they use a computer if they use the internet they're as exposed as anyone is um, and the sad part is you know for small businesses again without the resilience they can go out of they will go out of business and the stats are pretty pretty scary from that perspective so the cyber policy in and of itself in many cases sometimes becomes the most important asset the most important insurance policy that a small business can procure we've basically flipped from you know if you look back 18 months ago cyber insurance was let's face it for small businesses is a luxury product um, today it's compulsory um, some businesses realize that, but it will be an, it's an education curve, but, you know, you get three or five years out, um, all businesses will realize that, but, you know, it's a matter, you know, from us as you guys, as they're kind of trusted, you know, liability managers to be able to kind of, um, essentially educate them that they're, that they're, that they do have exposure. Everyone does. You know, from our perspective, the path forward for small businesses is, is pretty clear. Um, a lot of times what drives demands, and we see this with a lot of the, the accounts that we write in the, in the demand, it's a contract obligation, right? Um, many businesses essentially get, you know, they have a contract requirement that is essentially the impetus for them to get an insurance policy. Then they go to their uh, to their broker and say, Can you, I need a few million of, of limit to be able to sign this, sign this contract. The reality is at that point, then you're opening up the, you're, you're going back to them and saying, okay, fill out this RSA, ransomware supplemental application. You know, and that is where, you know, you basically the insured, the carrier essentially gets the, the hygiene of the, of the insured. What do they use for backups? Who do they use for MFA? What's their IR plan? Do they have endpoint security? How often was their patching cadence? Um, all of these controls, which were once, Essentially, you know, you know, which are kind of table stakes for large organizations are now table stakes for small. Um, essentially, it's the package of those things together that we really try to solve for, because in this world moving forward, again, there's a poverty gap for small businesses where they cannot keep up with the requirements that um, that they need to be able to procure not only the cyber insurance, but to be able to procure and maintain the controls that they now need that become kind of uh, come with contractual obligations. Um, you know, from our perspective, very quickly, um, the cyber insurance policy is becoming more important than EPL, the workers comp, you know, slip and falls, they don't put it, they don't put a small business out. Um, they don't cause insolvencies, but cyber can. Um, so we're really focused on building a product that can essentially solve for all the small businesses needs with one transaction. And it's important to note that, you know, regardless of insurance aside, what is happening in the regulatory space as it's developing over time and it's taken a while, but it's certainly getting there. And you've seen the Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC, with ransom payments sort of go in this direction for all businesses is that, again, forget about cyber insurance. They, they need to at least have some type of baseline of cybersecurity controls in place. They need to show that they put a good faith effort in trying to create positive cyber hygiene throughout their enterprise, that they had backups, that, that they implemented MFA, uh, that, that paying a ransom wasn't the first, the first thing that they wanted to do on their action list. It was a last ditch effort because all of the tools that they had put in place failed. They need to see mitigating circumstances uh, before you pay a ransom payment to get the all clear, at least from OFAC. And now other regulations are starting to be promulgated that have that same type of uh, mitigating factors in their in their review of when a when an insured make or a client makes a ransom payment. So um, not only is it becoming you need insurance to obviously safeguard your your liabilities and, and have somebody else pay the risk, uh, but you also need to have the actual tools in place to stave off any type of regulatory um, action against you. That's right. And just to add to that, uh, it was September 21st of, of last year where the um, the current administration basically pushed out the mandate across all the, the government, the federal governmental apparatus, where not only did obviously kind of all the, you know, the federal organizations need to procure controls and have the right protocols in place, et cetera, but um, anyone that touched them contract wise all the way down the food chain, right? So you think about that, and that was, um, you know, nine months ago, that basically pushed out that need for anyone on 
on the public sector that serve federal government. And that has a very, um, that has a ripple effect in the private sector, right? Because that kind of web of interdependencies and supply chains into the federal government manifests itself really quickly across private organizations as well. And that qu quite honestly is a lot of times what's driving that requirement from a contractual perspective. It's somewhere up the food chain, some general counsel, somewhere above from a vendor perspective, basically mandated, and that flows through really quickly. And you're starting to see that and you that won't stop. Um, that'll continue to push its way to the lower ends of, of the market. And one more point to add there, because it goes back to the misconception of risk for Main Street businesses, is that because you see these regul these regulations being issued by the federal government, recognizing that small businesses are in fact a target, have been paying ransoms, uh, is is be of because of the evidence that small businesses are a target. We're not talking about targets by Russia or a target by Iran. The, the idea of, of cyber criminal acts being extremely sophisticated and only targeting um, you know, elephants is, is no longer a reality. And the US government has focused on that. These, these are truly the 21st century of sort of highway robbers. They are able to get a, a package online that is for $10 on the, on the black market and able to then execute it against any type of low, low hanging fruit that is like a mom and pop retail shop or an auto body shop or a construction company. And then they execute it. They spray and pray across a wide variety of industries and targets and then hope that one or two hits and then they, they've, made their, they've made their money. These are truly just criminals. They're gangs. They're not, they're not sophisticated uh, nation state sponsored um, uh, organizations. These are literally just low, low hanging criminal or low level criminals that are targeting low hanging fruit. And that's why you see the federal government now paying attention to these businesses and requiring that they put these types of tools in place. Josh, I'll pass this one to you. Yeah, so cyber insurance uh, 3.0. We, um, as I as I mentioned before, I started at, at Ace Chubb when cyber insurance was just being bought by large retailers and healthcare organizations. It was starting to get into the middle market, but certainly wasn't a main street risk. That was your traditional cyber insurance where you got a paper application, you reviewed the risk, and then you issued terms, um, and if they bound or they didn't. Uh, that that lasted for a while, and it started to become a pretty crowded marketplace for that. Everybody was making money because it was only really the uh, the Fortune 500 that were getting hit where the big losses were piling up. And there really wasn't a need once that major account book sort of got corrected around 2015. There wasn't really a need to change anything yet in cyber because, uh, every, again, everybody was still profitable and making money. But then you had the, the emergence of a few insure techs in the late 2018-19 that started introducing these external vulnerability scans. And that's what we sort of consider cyber insurance 2.0. They would go beyond just the, the paper underwriting, the application underwriting, and actually conduct a technical investigation of an insured's um, existing URL structure. So uh, outside in, never inside out. And you know that has its uses. It can detect open RDP ports. It can detect other ports that could be an, an avenue for a bad actor to take advantage of, but it's only the outside end. So it's certainly limited in its use. And I'm sure at this point, you all have, have definitely brokered an account where you got one of these scans and you took it back to your insured and they didn't know, you know what any of the different bullet points met or they gave it to their MSP and their MSP said, this isn't, this isn't yours. This isn't your web address or web address. This isn't your, uh, your open port. Uh, and then you go back to the, the, the uh, insurer and you get into a, a, a shouting match back and forth and nobody's happy and you end up just moving on. Um, that has been adopted now by a lot of the larger carriers. Beasley is now doing a front end scan as well as Chubb. And again, they are have their uses, but they are somewhat limited, especially for the small business, and they don't really solve the problem for the small business. Uh, it helps protect certain loss ratios for some of these MGAs and, and other uh, insurance carriers, but it doesn't really do much for the actual um, small business insured. And so now as the next sort of generation of cyber insurance is growing up and, and quickly because cyber insurance is extremely dynamic. So you're getting through cyber insurance 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 in the span of eight years. But that is, again, the nature of cyber risk and, and the need for disruption in, in cyber insurance specifically as dynamic as it is. And the different industries and revenue bands require different approaches. Uh, treating a $20 million retailer the same way you're 
you're treating target isn't really fair. And those RSAs that you're getting today uh, are the same RSAs for a small business or the same ones that an upper middle market account is having to fill out. And you take it back to a small business and they don't understand it. They don't know how to digest it. And then you as a broker are in a position of trying to be a technical advisor to walk them through it. So uh, out of all of those frustrations, you are now seeing this next evolution, which is cyber insurance 3.0. Alpha Secure is one of them. There are others that are starting to develop and, and come out of the woodwork uh, because they recognize the need, just like we did, of what is happening in the small business space, um, basically getting left behind in the dust. And so cyber, insur- cyber Insurance 3.0 is actually embedding technology into the risk transfer process. It's giving insureds better risk management um, behind their firewall that's making them a better risk so that on the insurance side, we can better form our pricing. We can help them in the event of an actual attack. We can have a a material impact on loss ratios. And it's a continuous service throughout the life cycle of the policy. So from bind to final final expiration, uh, the MGAs are now focusing on giving them tools and services throughout the policy period that actually makes them continually a better risk and putting them in a position to make the right positive decisions that they need to become a better risk. Um, And so eight years ago, cyber insurance 1.0, here's a vendor list with CrowdStrike that has 15% off, go out and purchase an EDR product for $50,000. Small business takes that up rolls it up and throws it in the garbage. They can't afford it and they don't even understand it. Uh, Cyber insurance 2.0 is here's a front end scan that has all these vulnerabilities. Good luck fixing them. Um, Insured takes that scan, crumples it up and throws it in the trash can. Cyber insurance 3.0, that's we understand you don't understand any of this. We're just going to do it for you and make it easier for you and make you a better risk. So here it is. Take it off the broker's desk, take it off the insured and the insured's desk, and then have the insurance carrier completely aligned with the small business to make them a better risk um, by giving them the technology embedded in the risk transfer process. So that's really cyber insurance 3.0 and sort of the next generation of where we're all going, especially for the small business. Yeah, the, the analogy we like to use, it's like, imagine you're giving someone a homeowner, selling them a homeowner's policy, but you're also giving them an ADT alarm system, a generator, sensors, all those kind of risk controls, and you're operating them for them, right? Um, and, kind of, and, that's, and that's really where cyber is headed. You need to have that positive feedback loop. So, you know, we're, we're not on the risk unless we're in the risk. And if we're in the risk, then we're helping manage that risk and engineer that risk. Um, and all that has a positive feedback loop that ultimately results in lower premiums and better coverage for your insureds, right? That's, that's how it works, right? Lower loss ratios and pass that on because um, that's, well, you want to make it, you want to make the insurance basically um, work for the insured as well. And of course, this is this is not the first time that this sort of uh, insurance 3.0 has has made its way into the marketplace. In fact, no, you know, no good idea is really an original. And you can go all the way back to uh, Hartford Steam Boiler in the early 1900s, who was suffering devastating losses in their steam boiler um, insurance book, and they actually designed a safer steam steam boiler and made their made their clients utilize that design if they wanted their insurance and they gave them those specs they helped them create it and then they installed it and then they were able to get insurance so we've seen this sort of evolution before in other product lines where the insurance carrier wants to provide risk transfer to the insureds they understand their insureds can't do it on their own so they help them get into a right place where everybody's fully aligned and 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 delivering better losses and experiences to everybody So this is this is an idea, an infographic of all of the tools that a small business is expected to have in today's marketplace to be insurable. So when you get those RSAs and you're looking at the cyber landscape and all the threats that are coming and what the cyber insurance carriers are asking for, these are generally the the big the the, the big items that they like uh, all their insurance to be able to affirmatively say they have. So multi-factor authentication, real-time threat monitoring is a type of EDR, endpoint detection and response tool, a VPN if you're going to be remoting into a a server somewhere, critical data backups. They need to know that you have your your crown jewels stored safely and you can restore them in the event that you have any type of incident. Software version management, patching. Uh, Patching and and failure to patch is one of the biggest threat vectors for for bad actors to take advantage of. You're you're operating Microsoft Office 365 and it's five years old and you haven't updated it once. There's probably a hundred vulnerabilities that that have been published at this point that any bad actor can come in and take advantage of. Um, So they're looking for insureds to have a very aggressive patch cadence, you know, patching critical patches in under five days. 
but understanding those patches is very difficult for a small business. So you, most small businesses don't know what CVE is or what the NIST, the NIST, uh, the NIST database is where you can even look what, look up to see what the CVEs are. And then of course, um, moving beyond that, the security operations center, that, that night guard, the 24 seven security op that's sitting there helping you, watching for you, looking out for you when you're sleeping, when you've turned off your machine, you need to know that there is somebody who is behind your firewall, looking over all of your programs and applications and network connections and making sure that there is no anomalous behavior, or if they do detect anomalous behavior, that they're able to reach out to you quickly to mitigate and triage and then escalate if necessary. So uh, a lot of a lot of the cyber insurance carriers, you know, look for other things beyond these these tools, but these are the core tools and services that they're looking for applicants to have uh, in order to be insurable in the small small business marketplace. And suffice it to say, these are the tools that we deliver to our insurance at Bind. So our insurance coverages, uh, going back to sort of that, that misconception of risk for the, the Main Street um, risk. Cyber policy, uh, there was a guy who used to go on panels all the time and he used to open up every single one of his panels saying the worst thing they ever did calling a cyber policy was a cyber policy. It's because it has a whole host of other coverages that aren't just cyber specific. There's a lot of privacy related uh, coverages in there, as well as third party liability coverages. Uh, but it is important to understand all the coverages because not every cyber policy is made the same. There are core coverages that you see common across a lot of the, the main competitors, including extortion payment, business interruption, et cetera. But it's important to focus on some of the ancillary coverages, um, as well as the nuances within those sort of core coverages. So as the cyber landscape has drastically changed, you're going to see business interruption on a policy, or you're going to see full, you're going to see ransomware coverage on a policy. But like, what does that coverage actually look like? Is it is it truly full limits, or is there 50% coinsurance, 25% coinsurance? Does a business interruption waiting period? Is it 24 hours? You know, from for a waiting period for all those who, who don't necessarily understand that that's the amount of time that an insured actually has to be down before their, their cyber policy will even cover um, any type of claim. So you can see coverages like ours where we offer six hours, some again are 24 hours, some are 12 hours, some are 18 hours. Most small businesses, if you're down for an entire day um, before your coverage even um, triggers, you're, you're already facing a pretty steep loss to your profits or any type of revenue stream. Uh, with, the, with the ransomware coverage, I already mentioned the coinsurance. You also see a lot of that being sublimated now. Um, if an insured has poor controls, if they can even get a quote, there's probably going to be some type of sublimit or coinsurance on the ransomware payment. And then the period of restoration. That's a big one with business interruption. We talk about ransomware and business interruption together because they usually come hand in hand. The, uh, one of the more devastating parts of the ransomware claim is the resulting business interruption. Sure, if you end up having to pay your ransom, that could be a million bucks right out the gate. But you know, if you have a $3 million policy or a $5 million policy, the other three or four could easily be uh, could easily be eroded by your business interruption, depending on how long you're done for. So that period of restoration speaks directly to business interruption. It means how, how much time is the insurance policy giving you to be down and recover a claim? So some, some carriers will have a period of restoration that's only 30 days. Some will have 60 days. Some will have a year like we do. Uh, but it's very important to pay attention to those nuances within the policy because it, it can have a severely limiting impact on how insureds recover underneath one of the most devastating cyber claims they can have, which is a, which is a ransomware claim that then results in um, business interruption. Uh, moving beyond that, I'll, I'm going to focus on, oh, sorry, just go back real quick, Gordon. Um, I want to focus just on a few more on here real quick. Uh, the social engineering cover, you all probably know this one better than almost any other insuring agreement because it does hit small businesses a lot. And this is one of those misconceptions of coverages that I, I love to point out because you could have your construction company who maybe has one, one laptop, one email account, no website, but they have a vendor who emails them an invoice. And what they didn't know was that it's actually a bad actor behind that invoice, um, directing them to send it to a different account that's not the actual vendor that they do work with. Um, that's a type of social engineering cover. That is an exposure that all businesses have um, and that all businesses should have type of coverage for. But there are nuances, again, within that coverage in different forms. 
So some forms require that you have the dual authentication, which is, did you follow a process in place to verify that that vendor you were sending it to was actually the vendor you were supposed to send it to? Sometimes that's uh, a process in place of picking up the phone and calling the vendor to see if they sent them the change of change in uh, wiring instructions, or if this was in fact them sending them the invoice. Some policies require that. If you don't follow that process, then you will not get coverage for your claim. Other policies such as ours um, and many others in the marketplace don't have that type of requirement. Uh, it's just if you if you wire it to the wrong person um, in response to some type of fraudulent instruction, you'll get coverage under the claim. So again, nuances within a very popular coverage that um, some brokers may not necessarily pay attention to. And then of course, just two more I'm gonna hit on briefly, uh, the unlawful collection coverage. That's becoming a huge issue as privacy regulations have become much, much more onerous with the CCPA in California and BIPA in Illinois. Um, There's so many other states now between Washington and Texas and Virginia that have all recently implemented strict data privacy regulations that require you as a business, if you're collecting any type of data, even if it's email addresses and names, that you have some type of policy in place that allows them to uh, reach out and have you delete their information, provide them the information that you're collecting, et cetera. And that is not a very common coverage in a lot of policies. Um, a lot of policies don't cover that or they carve out certain certain um, exclusions that uh, don't give you a full, full, full breadth of coverage if you have it. Uh, but you see in the CCPA, it doesn't, there's, they're revenue band agnostic. You can be a small business and still be exposed to that type of regulation. So it's very important that you're obviously checking all the boxes on the first party coverages for ransomware, business interruption, e-crime, et cetera, but really pay attention to some of the third party coverages because you never know when a retailer is collecting credit card data or they're collecting um, customer loyalty data and they get hit with a regulatory action and you, you've sold them a policy that doesn't have any type of coverage for that type of loss. Um, so it is, it, it is becoming a much, much emerging, a much more emerging risk in this sort of cyber slash privacy threat landscape. And that goes back to my, my anecdote about calling it a cyber policy because there's a ton of privacy exposures that are picked up in a cyber policy that um, some folks may not even think about or contemplate. I won't spend any time more here, but if anybody wants to talk about coverage is that after this, I'm, I'm happy to, to nerd out about it with you guys. So what we wanted to do here, if kind of if you look at the far right column, um, what we try to articulate in this slide is the cost that a small business would essentially endure to not only buy a, a base policy. So in this in this case, we used to say take three thousand dollars as kind of an example premium, um, but also the incremental cost of procuring all the software essentially necessary in today's environment to procure, to be able to answer an RSA appropriately. Now, to be fair, there's a handful of markets out there today that'll still let small businesses get away with limited controls. Um, I promise you within six to nine months and definitely next year, they won't be around anymore because well, they, their losses just will, are, are untenable. But so essentially what's evolving very quickly is for a small business to go have the luxury of paying $3,000 for, for a cyber policy, they have to go spend an incremental um, $14,000 to be able to go buy all the tools necessary. So what we did is we kind of did uh, kind of, we ran a bunch of RFPs and samples of a, of a 10, of a 10 person business. So 10 endpoints, there's 10 laptops. And what would it cost to protect that organization and purchase um, all essentially the, the software um, solutions on the, far, on the far left. And when you add that up, you get to a point where you're paying very easily, you know, uh, you know $15,000 to be able to spend an additional three on your cyber policy. Um, our proposition is don't spend that additional money. Um, just buy the policy from us and we deliver all those tools to you. So essentially a comprehensive solution for that small business. Cause you know, at the end of the day, what, what small business has an extra 15 or 20 grand uh, uh, laying around to be able to, you know, go out and buy these things, never mind configure them, maintain them, have the technical expertise to be able to do all that. Um, let someone else do that for you. And that's, and that's what we do. That's what we're here for. And then God forbid, you know, again, cyber, there's no, there's no silver bullet here. All these are tools to mitigate risk and provide resilience. God forbid um, there is an incident you have the policy to respond to it. Um, so we think our solution for small business is, is uh, definitely the 
the path forward um, and material and more and more so we're seeing kind of every day some of the, um, our competitors beginning to kind of move in this direction. Um, so again, an extraordinary value proposition that actually translates to bottom line dollars to your small business. If they are actually buying one or two or three of these tools, um, essentially they could uh, you know forego paying that cancel that contract and the net the net kind of bottom line delta to them might actually be a free insurance contract with all those tools from us um, because of the way the, because of the way the math works. Risk appetite by class of business. Um, these are pretty, pretty standard uh, appetites across the, the entire cyber insurance landscape today. And there's a lot of reasons for it. I don't want to spend too much time on it. So we have enough uh, time for questions at the end, but as you can see it, it a lot of the classes of business are tied not necessarily to what their exposures would be, but also tied to what their cybersecurity um, apparatus looks like today. So I'm going to focus on the non-eligible industries and, and point out why you're going to see uh, have a hard time placing some of these risks with a lot of markets in today's in today's um, environment. So if you take a look at public administration, municipalities, and education are two big ones that I want to focus on because they are sort of representative of what of what the small business is facing in this environment, which is a budget constraint. Um, municipalities don't have the, the money to afford all of the really sophisticated tools that they need or the technical expertise that they need to implement them um, sufficiently across their enterprise. And it's really compounded by the fact, um, specifically in public administration and municipalities, um, that they are a target for these more sophisticated nation state hackers. So if you think of like Russia, um, Iran, they are focusing on cities. They are focusing on towns and municipalities because in their minds, it's the easiest way to disrupt everyday life for Americans. So not only are, are municipalities having a hard time getting the cybersecurity tools that they need to get the insurance that they need or to, to even just adequately protect themselves from a cyber event, they're also a target by a lot of these more sophisticated um, criminal uh, gangs. The education front is the same exact thing. Um, there is one nuance with the education and placing those risks, with me, which maybe some of you have run into, which is which is certainly interesting, in that with MFA, multi-factor authentication requirements, is that schools, uh, a lot of the teachers are unionized and to ask any type of extra step that they have to take into using their own personal phones, such as entering an SMS code for uh, multi-factor authentication or using an app on their phone for the authentication uh, re would require union approval. And so they have been very slow in adopting MFA in a lot of, a lot of education districts um, across the US because of that dynamic. And as a result, they haven't been meeting the requirements to be insurable by a lot of the carriers in today's environment. A lot of the other uh, non-eligible industries in here follow sort of the same tack as municipalities. When you think about utilities and you think about transportation, they're usually publicly funded and they're usually targets for sophisticated nation state actors, uh, which again makes them harder to place in the cyber insurance market. But beyond that, there are ways to solve, and especially from Alpha's view, there are ways to solve for these SMEs on Main Street and the risks that we get to see. If you think about construction firms, which I've spent a lot of time talking about, and the misconception of coverage, that are mis misconception of risk, they certainly do have uh, real estate, retail, financial institutions, accountants, lawyers, all, any type of professional service that don't have an in-house IT, they don't have an MSSP that they can afford. Um, those are the types of classes of business that we solve for and that Cyber Insurance 3.0 is really designed for. Um, and we were approaching those full heartedly, um, total green light growing with all those types of classes because we can solve for those risks. And they're generally not a target for nation state actors who are absolutely 100% trying with 100 people to get into their network to, to, uh, to attack them. And I won't belabor this slide, but we think with kind of cyber 3.0 essentially comes the need for robust customer success, right? You think back to kind of Beasley and what they kind of invented with the, the BBR policy, actual an onboarding process. 
The onboarding process is critical. Um, it's critical for the insured. It's critical for you guys, right? You don't want to be the go between, you know, explaining, you know, cyber risk prevention and the necessary compliance that they need to do to maintain their policy, et cetera. Um, so that's really where we think the cyber 3.0 companies like us take over as essentially kind of an outsourced technical support for the insured, for the small business who literally doesn't have anyone to call when they have a question about, you know, how do I, how do I install software? How do I do a, you know, how do I do a version update? So essentially, you know, we and others are removing that burden from, from the broker um, to enable basically a, essentially a seamless um, integration with the insured and have kind of full outsource capabilities. And again, going back to the security operations center and sort of that 24 seven help in this cyber landscape, a lot of uh, carriers are looking for insureds to have that type of capability in place. Again, completely unscalable for a small business to do it on their own, but it really has a massive impact on the incident and claims process. If you have a SOC that has the ability to go beyond the firewall, look at what's happening, pull down log data that they can review and then share with outside um, IT forensic firms, then the small business is in a materially better place than they would be if they didn't have that. And so that's an added benefit with this sort of cyber insurance 3.0 evolution and health secure in particular is that all of our insurers get access to that. So there's going to be a lot of times when a SOC is reaching out to a client and letting them know about behavior that looks suspicious in their network that the small business never would have known about. They wouldn't know about it until six months later after they've been hit with ransomware and they can no longer run their business. So the idea that if you can spot that type of suspicious activity early and remove it from your system, then that ransomware claim never happens. And so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a huge impact for the small business and giving them that type of ability um, through a risk transfer like this is, is almost immeasurable. And it also helps with the actual incident response. In the event that a claim does happen, because there is a SOC that has that behind the firewall data, they can pull down logs that a small business doesn't even know exist. Most small businesses don't have log data, and if they do, they don't know how to get it. And those, log, those logs are critical to any type of review and expulsion of the bad actor. The logs are basically tracking any type of network connections, who's entering the system and when, where do they go, et cetera. Um, and being able to pull that down quickly and give to a third-party IR firm as a part of our claims process that jumpstarts the investigation is extraordinarily powerful in pinpointing exactly what happened, where and when, and saves a lot of costs during the forensic review that normally an IR firm with a small business is having to recreate completely from scratch and adds a lot of fees to the entire investigation. So by providing this type of SOC functionality, both from an early claims detection and mitigation and then to a triage and actual forensic cost mitigations perspective, um, giving that to a small business is, is a very powerful, powerful uh, proposition. So with that, we'd just like to kind of pause. There's a lot, um, but we we'll definitely want to open up for questions um, and uh, be able to dig in wherever wherever you guys want. <laughs>